Hey babes, welcome back to my channel. Right now we're gonna dive into two seconds. The month that I focused and deep dived selfishly all about myself since my name is Cassandra. <laughs> um, but yeah, welcome back. I usually go by Cass. Um, this has been a month in October where I really slowed down my reading to be honest and I focus specifically on these two books. I had another third book called This Shining Life that I was reading, but I put the pause on it because I've just been so busy with work and I've been editing births and weddings like crazy. <laughs> I have also done this podcast, which I will link below because our other episode, our first podcast episode will be dropping on Halloween. Um, and then a ton of other things coming on that channel, on the Stolen Nostalgia channel. It was my birthday this month. Like, I will drop an iCard for the monthly wrap up here to go over everything. It's like vlog style, which is why this is separate because usually I include my book reviews into my monthly wrap up. But I think I'm going to start separating them because I'm really into I guess what is considered vlog style, which isn't my preferred way of speaking about it or categorizing it. I just am a videographer and I love capturing things in video form and keeping those memories in moving picture. So I appreciate the vlog style of things in that aspect of sharing kind of what's happening. So long-winded intro over, we are going to deep dive into <laughs> Not upside down. Uh, Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are Storytellers, The Human Story Changes by Elizabeth Lesser. And I've got a chai tea latte, hopefully you can see this logo, by Baked in Denver. If you're ever in Denver, please go here. Best chai tea latte I've ever had. And their donuts, especially the cake donuts, are delicious. In this first section, all I'm going to do is review this. <laughs> we have four days in the month and I've just barely started this one. So that will be coming a little bit later. But first I did, I went into this, hmm, how do I start this? First, if you watch the book haul, which oh, I card where I talked about getting these two books, um, I had kind of gotten emotional and talked about what I was told my name kind of meant my whole life and living under the shadow of the pleaser of men. Um, and I always think I misunderstood it as thinking like I had to please a man <laughs> to feel like worthy of my name. Um, I guess it can be understood as a pleaser or helper of mankind, so just humans in general, which is I appreciate more that kind of definition of it. This, so that's why I picked these two books, that's why I bought them, that's why I decided to read them. I just have continued to say I've had a difficult, very difficult year with just things emotionally and healing um, that I really wanted almost an, the excuse or the reason to lean into learning more about Cassandra in history and giving, hoping that that would give me more just like grounding, I guess, just like trying to see and appreciate my name in a different way. Ah, it's hot. <laughs> so I started out with this one by Eliz Elizabeth Lesser. Never heard of it before searching up my own name. Um, it says the King County Library System in Washington, but I got it off of thrift, thrift books. And then on the inside it says no longer property of the King County Library System as of April 2022. So I got this pretty quickly, but let me go over a quick synopsis of what the book categorizes itself as. And I wanted to do a more like deep dive, which is why I limited my reading so far. I say so far in this month, I haven't even started the second book. Well, I started the second book, I'm not very far into it. But this says, what if men and women had told our 
or origin tales and hero myths are guiding stories about love and sex, power and war, and the values we live by. Imagine if the books written, the movies directed, and the art made by women had also been called the greatest, the most powerful, the creations that define what it means to be human. What if women had been storytellers too? Cassandra Speaks answers these questions and explores what happens now when women dig deep for the courage to speak for our own experiences, when we flex our confidence, and when we tell new stories that champion caretaking, veneric compassion, and elevate communication over vengeance and violence. Uh, Elizabeth Lesser shows how change in the culture starts with interchange and that no one woman or man is immune to the corrupting influence of power. She offers a vision to transcend the either-or ideologies on both sides of the gender debate and provides tools to help all people be both gentle and powerful, caring and courageous, and ready to work together to create a better world for everyone. Which I genuinely feel like that's what this book was for. I did rate this a 5 out of 5 star, which can we just take a minute to discuss the rating system on book review anything? I struggle hardly to rate something as a five star. Like in my mind, I've always equated it to being like the best book I've ever read of my entire life. And so I put a lot of pressure on the five star. Um, I think there's a few things that I've rated like four and four and a half star this year that kind of taking more of a chill approach to it, I would rate as a five star. So I rated this as a five star because it was such a book that just discussed power, women in power, our misunderstanding of power, um, how she deep dives into like what the actual meaning of power is and how it has been misinterpreted and changed over time and how now it's associated with violence and aggressiveness and all these very negative like aggressive terms um and women don't like to be associated with that word um and it explains why and it just like so i guess i'm getting a little bit ahead of myself i'm not sure if you can tell i dog-eared quite a lot i've written it quite a lot um there's so many things that I could read you out of here and I may kind of pop in and out and read certain things because there's one section that really stuck with me. Um, but overall, I would describe the book as like a collection of essays. In the beginning, we touch on like the mythological kind of stories of Pandora and Cassandra and I think it's Gaia. Ah, Eve, Pandora, Cassandra, Galatea, and then it goes into the greatest books. And then that's the whole part one is origin stories. Part two is power stories where it discusses the old story of power, women in power, in praise of fathers, doing power differently, the first first responders, which I thought was a very interesting take. Um, a day without a war metaphor, which I feel is so important. A revolution of values. And then part three is a brave new ending, which is a toolbox for inner strength. So I feel like the entire last third of the book, which is page 211 to 2, I'm gonna say like 290, I think, 289, 290, is tools that definitely lean more in the self-help sphere of understanding who you are, helping find your grounding. Um, one is innervism, which is a word that she kind of made up. Meditation, do no harm and take no shit, a meditative practice, overcoming the imposter syndrome, Cassandra speaks, take the other to lunch, fill, flip the script, the oath, legacy, dream, and Fernway, I think is how you say the last one. Um, I know that that kind of turns off a lot of people because they, a lot of people aren't, a lot of people are different kind of book readers. Some people stay really true to their genres that they like and I get that. So there was some negative feedback about how some of this leaned really self-help. There was negative feedback about how she so very barely scratched the surface of the mythological kind of side of things since she chose to name it Cassandra. Um, and then of course the cover, which kind of gives more of that vibe that it's going to deep dive more into that. I didn't find any issue with that. I kind of appreciated her touching on it 
And honestly, <laughs> this book made me mad. Definitely in the first third of the book, not necessarily, maybe like the first fifth of the book, I was angry in reading all of this because when you, and as she does in here, as um, Lesser does in here, she combines all these different mythological things, but just in context about how women have been spoken about throughout history. And it's always dismissed. We need to be submissive. It's just basically almost allowing <laughs> women to be abused and pushed to the side and not believed like in Cassandra's sake and the whole story of that. You get to see how she is taking what is said in these stories and then applying it to the message of how women in the feminine side of everything it has always been downcast and shut out which again goes back to where she says when women are storytellers the human story changes and i think that's very true i wrote a few notes to make sure i hit a few places but i put new take on power with empathy and compassion which yes <laughs> which is a huge part of how i felt about this book a lot of this book was just me saying yes yes that's exactly it yes that's what it is yes that's right just a lot of i'm lacking the word i'm trying to think of here but just like confirmation there you go it was just like a lot of confirmation of just self-acceptance and self acknowledgement and getting courage and self-love and so it was very self-helpy in that kind of way to be like you're a badass and you can do this and you should do this and you should stand up for yourself and you should stand up for other women um i said it's a collection of essays she's written i can see the overarching theme tilting it titling it cassandra Discussion about what power actually means versus how twisted, aggressive, and forceful we interpret it now. Um, definitely, I wrote, definitely recommend for YA feminine folks and just in general for anyone wanting that type of here's your sign about standing strong and valuing yourself and your voice among the patriarchy. Which, yes, I think this is a great book to recommend to anyone really. I think it was a great book, but just definitely I would recommend it to a lot of young adults, a lot of feminine identifying young adults because it it is that backbone. It helps call attention to the backbone that we all wish we had and that we're fighting for now. And it kind of gave me um, honestly, my foot, my leg's going numb because I'm sitting on the ground. It kind of gave me a different perspective, even on the side of feminism. I've always been on the fence about, I don't consider myself to be a feminist, um, and kind of what that means to me and how that's developed throughout time and the dark sides that feminism has taken on and good sides and all of that. So it's kind of in that aspect made me reevaluate things even further which is something that i love like give me more information i'm not always necessarily looking to have my perspective changed but i really appreciate when something makes me second guess reevaluate make sure i'm constantly always looking at myself to see if there's places that I can be more compassionate or have more empathy or get more firm or have a backbone about things more. Um, and this really does tie in two personal things for me of feeling like I have tried many times to step up and speak my truth about things and a lot of people have hated it and the conflict of different generations and that really does, speaking generationally, it really does talk in here about the status quo of what your generational fathers and grandfathers and they always acted as what was expected of them and it doesn't mean it was always right and then how that is really changing now in society of fathers that are taking on more equal parts of the workload of taking care of children while women step out and work and those kinds of generational things that like didn't exist in my grandma's time like my grandma stayed at home uh, one specifically i'm speaking about but she 
stayed at home and raised kids and cooked and cleaned and took care of the house while my grandpa was always the one out working. And that was kind of the household environment that I was raised in. So part of me always like placed that as success. And I'm not saying that it isn't if that's what someone wants, but I really leaned heavy into thinking that was what I wanted. Feeling like that was what I wanted and then doing things outside of that made me feel like I was failing at life because I wasn't achieving being a stay-at-home mom. And I did for a bit, but like being a stay-at-home mom and why didn't I like cooking <laughs> because of what should be my job and I'm supposed to stay home and I'm feminine and a man is strong and like just those kinds of things that have been taught throughout society. She kind of not forces you but brings up the point of pushing against that not to be hateful towards anyone but just to evaluate if if that's the right way to do things for you personally anymore. Um, so yes it's speaking as like a collective of everyone and I say women she's not hateful towards men in here really at all there's a lot of points where you can see she's very specific and careful with what she speaks about because she doesn't want it to seem like a male hating type of book um because a lot of times she'll be like for men and women women and men or <laughs> all humans and that kind of talk which I think is good. You don't want to typecast yourself to be like women proud and men hate, like women good, men bad type situation. It isn't like that at all. I don't get that vibe. A few people brought that up, but I think everyone in the reviews collectively was like, she does a good part. And there was a few reviews that I saw from men that were like, I think this should be required reading period for all men. I wrote, when you compile all the stories of how women have been represented, ignored, downcast all together in like one section it paints a very clear picture and truly helps me understand feminism more i said also part memoir which i love because she does bring in personal things in her life but she doesn't go like full memoir status she just interweaves it into parts in the book and i think it works um love the section of deep diving on greatest novels and books and the statistics of how many how many women have won recognition awards versus men, which I thought was interesting. She really talks about stories in that section, like the greatest books of all time and stuff. And I think there's only like one, one written by a woman on that list. Um, and just how collectively the average woman would do everything different than the way that a man has not only in writing those books not only in how we take care of things in the world not only in how we try to like solve problems but just in so many other spheres which i think is a very important conversation i said exercises the last third of the book that i can see very useful to someone fresh in of regaining their sense of self not for me, but I appreciate the complexity of telling these stories and breaking everything down and then offering a way and help to someone lifting themselves up, which I think is important. Like, cause I could see how this book could break you a bit. <laughs> you feel like, fuck, we're doomed or we've been doomed. I said, I'm also majorly appreciate that she calls attention to us taking a look at our own biases and that it isn't a hate on men book, but also representation of how things could and would be different if women were, rep were represented equally throughout history. The powering great lesson should have been shared about women before us. Um, I'm of a different mindset in my life now as seeing male aggression. This is a note I wrote. <laughs> I said I'm of a different mindset now as seeing male aggression as extreme weakness. Their inability, inability to look at their wrongs, their inability to look at themselves, communicate, admit their wrongs, think women are capable and honestly downright, their refusal to appreciate and respect women is a source of weakness that is running our country, which is personally how I feel. Um, I said, and of course, not all men are like this, but flip side, not all women are you know, acting with empathy. So it's not an all or nothing kind of situation. Um, I said, I really appreciate the topics about war in here. And this Wonder Woman section really stuck with me. I'll read that to you in a second. Um, 
but I've never liked superhero movies and this helped me define into words what my dislike about them is. The violence, this aggressive hero's journey should not be admired. I get it's fantasy like retelling of comics, but it's not a representation of anything I think anyone should like, I guess, besides short brief entertainment, because I have an issue with them. Um, and I said, the way it made me mad about big dick contests and the fact of war. Fighting violence with violence to end violence is the most back assword thing we've ever done as a nation, ever. And then my cons that I kind of like, I wrote these, you know, while reading it, were Urzon self-help, like in the latter half, which isn't for everyone. She repeated the same quote in each chapter multiple times. Um, I'm not sure why it was necessary. And I said just barely touches on the mythology aspect, which I was hoping to dive much deeper into, like Cassandra and Pandora and all those kinds of things. Um, however, quickly, this is a deep diving kind of thing. Some of this stuff really got me sad in the beginning though. She goes into this telling of like what sparked all of this. She talks about it like through religion and she compiles this stuff all together and it just hurts me. It says, gosh, where do I start this? Then Eve got curious, talk about like Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve got curious, listened to a snake, seduced Adam into disobeying God, and everything after that went downhill, the fall. That's the foundation, the one that sets all the, up all the others, the first story to paint womankind as second in creation and first to sin. Their tagline brands our culture. It's our DNA, it defines our daily lives, it lives in our bodies. To give you a taste of the legacy passed down to us from Adam and Eve, here are three quotes from writing I explore in greater detail in part one. From... from I think it's Tertullian, and an early Christian writer often called the founder of Western theology. This is the quote. Quote, In pain you shall bring forth children, women, and you shall turn to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And do you not know that you are Eve? God's sentence hangs still over all your sex, and his punishment weighs down upon you. You are the devil's gateway. You are she who first violated the forbidden tree and broke the law of God. Because of you, even the son of God had to die." End quote. From these names, from Ecle Ecclesiasticus, an early biblical book of morals, quote, a gift from the Lord is a silent wife, and nothing is so precious as her self-discipline. Charm upon charm is a wife with a sense of shame, and nothing is more valuable than her bound-up mouth." End quote. And this one from Misna, a sacred Jewish compendium of laws, quote, To the women, God gave nine curses, the burden of blood of menstruation and the blood of virginity, the burden of pregnancy, the burden of childbirth, the burden of bringing up the children. Her head is covered. As one is mourning, she pierces her ear like a permanent slave. She is not to be believed as a witness." End quote. <sighs> she goes on to how that made her feel. She says part two is about like power. I mean, and there's so many things. So many things she mentions in these first several pages of just the origin stories of women. Um, and it says, I, at the beginning she has these quotes, and this one says, history isn't what happened, it's who tells the story, which I think is true. Let's see, what's the next? It says, to the essence of these teachings, many of which found their way into the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, can be dis distilled down to this. One, men are better than women, even the wicked men. Two, a woman's sense of shame is deserved. Shame for what? our out of control emotions and our wanton sexuality that has the power to tempt a man to destroy his virtue. Three, a woman should be silent with a bound up mouth. Four, men dominate women to protect women from other men. Five, alliances between women are dangerous. Um, these are just hard. She talks about that the biblical themes show up in classic literature of modern media from Paradise Lost to the Scarlet Letter. And from Star Trek to Harry Potter. She says, I share here with a few of the more salient quotations from some of Western's religion's foundational thinkers and texts. If it seems as if I'm cherry picking only the most incredulary and misogynistic 
excerpts, I invite you to read deeper into any of these books and authors. I am only scratching the surface. I'll start with this prayer from the ancient Siddur, recited during Orthodox Jewish men each morning. Quote, Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has not made me a woman. End quote. <laughs> It was difficult for me to only choose a few quotes from the early Christian thinkers, monks, and saints. There are so many. Here's a small sampling from Timothy. Quote, I wrote yuck next to this. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the, on the one deceived. It was the woman who deceived. <laughs> it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with pro pro propriety. I wrote on this side of this one, imagine being religious and feeling shame for ever existing. Um, this one, from Martin Luther, quote, there's so many in here, there's so many, there's so many pages of this. Quote from Martin Luther, quote, if women become tired or even die, that does not matter. Let them die in childbirth. That is why they are there, end quote. So <laughs> you can kind of see just why I think so much of this is just a good read to just categorize how we've been treated in women. When it talks about power, I said this is why learning origins of words is important versus thinking how we define them now should always override intended meaning because how we adapt and work around what we think power means now is not its actual meaning. Um, and then I wrote here in her book, she says, again, I'm not giving you the full context, but it says, as women claim power, as we protagonist, as we become protagonists in the story that shape our world, we must keep asking these questions. Power for what purpose? Influence why? Promotion, money, leadership to what end? What are we going to use our power for? And I wrote good thought for deep discussions. And there's just so much. I, I've dog-eared this and done this. I've written all over these pages. There's just so much. I wish, I think I want to find, where is it at? Where is it at? My battery's going to die. Okay, fresh battery change. Uh, I don't want to go on to too much more, but because obviously I'm not reading you the whole book, so if any of this interests you, I would recommend buying it, second handing it, <laughs> finding it in your library. Um, this section, you know, kind of made a lot of sense to me just in talking about healing trauma through my whole life. Uh, it says, My father was a man of his generation. He was not supposed to speak his heart, ask for help, use words to reach across the ocean that separates one human from another. He was unschooled in the give and take of intimacy. I am sure that beneath my father's one note, strong and silent song, was a rich symphony of feelings and experiences, but we never got to hear it. And of course that rung home with me. Um, I still wanted to find... <laughs> She speaks about therapy in here the way that I thought therapy would work for me, so I connected with that too. Women too are conditioned to hide their feelings, especially if they're angry or shameful ones. Few of us receive education in how to be brave about our feelings, open to expressing them, and receptive to the feelings of others. Instead, we repress and implode, or we act out and explode. But when you have had it pounded into you since you were a child that strength and vulnerability cannot dwell on the same person, emotional intelligence sounds like a disease. So it's like she's not the first person to say all this stuff, but I really appreciated the collected of how everything was brought together here. I'm trying to find that section. I had such a hard time finding this because I was discussing it with my husband. This is the section that's the first first responders. And the reason I'm reading this is because it just like really stuck with me. So if women are going to do power differently, we need art, novels, TV shows, and film to reflect our aspirations. Storytellers are the meaning makers in our society, and therefore they have the weighty influence and the ability to move humanity forward. Of course, sometimes stories are just told are told just to entertain. There is certainly a, a time and place for that, but I feel a sense of loss when a book or a play or a film misses out on an opportunity to push the cultural dial, to change the narrative, to show and tell us how to do power differently. In 2017 and again in 2020, Wonder Woman re-emerged on the big screen to join the pantheon of male superheroes have become, who have become ubiquitous in cinema. 
she names a ton, I'm not gonna name them here, and a slew of other uh, heroic characters. I know many people who love Wonder Woman movies, especially women who have been waiting patiently for a female superhero protagonist. I appreciate that a woman director took the most powerful female comic book her hero and added her story to the genre. And I know that sometimes in fortifying to experience a physical sense of we can do it through a work of art. Still, I felt disappointed. I went into the first film expecting a new kind of power story. Instead, I left the theater wondering why the heck would a woman with superpowers choose to leave a tropical island paradise, pierce through the veil of time and space just to go into war and kick ass while looking hot. This is like something I've never quite thought about. Here are all the formidable superpowers Wonder Woman has. Uh, which, again, I didn't know any of these, but I didn't grow up reading comics, so. She has super strength, bulletproof bracelet, bracelets, and the lasso of truth. She's telepathic, clairvoyant, and can astrally project herself backward and forward through time. She can raise people from the dead, fly at terrific speeds, and is omni-linguistic, linguistic, speaking every language known to humankind. Like... That's a ton of awesome powers. If you had those kinds of powers, wouldn't you use them to do something other than march into a World War I battle and do hand-to-hand -hand combat? Like, what a disappointment. Just her command of many languages puts her at an advantage to sit everyone down and talk some sense into them, not to mention the ability to go back in time, raise some pertinent folks from the dead, and change what led up to the war in the first place. But no. Wonder Woman uses her superpowers to do power exactly the way it's always been done, to continue the fruitless pursuit of violence as a way to end violence, which is us, Ugh, so frustrating, to perpetuate the narrative of winning versus losing. Some will say that she shows more empathy and remorse than other superheroes, but that hardly makes her a poster girl for doing power differently. Because what good is empathy or remorse if we don't actually change our basic behavior to match our elevated feelings? I felt this so hard at it, clearly. For millennia, women have honed the heart, empathy, intimacy, caretaking, communication. Now it's time for us to validate what we know and put it into action, into art, into education, into skills. But that is not what happens in Wonder Woman. Even on the all-female island where the movie franchise starts, the only power skill we see the girls and women being taught is warfare. Like, that resonates. I'm going to stop reading stuff out of here because I could go on forever, but that last P resonates with me so much about why I don't like superheroes, why I am anti-war, why I hate our president now and the one we just had in Trump. I don't like Biden. Like, just in the politi political sphere, what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, I was married to someone prior in the military and I hated all of it. And I just have like such a disdain for, like I had said earlier, my own opinion about men acting this way. I think it is the most fucking weak thing in the world. And that's a bias I have. And I recognize that maybe they think they're doing the right thing and maybe they think that's the only way to settle things because that's what we've always done. But as they talk about <laughs> the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And it just makes me so sad. Like violence hurts me so much on like such a different level. Um, so there's a lot of things in this book that I feel like connected with me. I, I think I'm done <laughs> reviewing it. I have so much stuff. There are things in here. I don't agree with everything she said. I don't like certain things about the book, but overall, I, I wish there was more inclusivity of those that maybe, I'm kicking my camera, um, those that maybe like identify in a feminine way that's not touched on at all in here. Um, it's very like broken down between women and men, period. Um, and I can see how that could exclude a lot of people. I can see how, unfortunately, a lot of these people mentioned and discussed in the book are white women and men, um, and how that's not inclusive. Uh, but for a lot of those sections, I guess I can understand it because she's just talking about history and what's pre-existed. Um, and then talking about how we can change that and I agree that we can and I think I've seen a change in difference since growing up and you know Just things continue to change 
I found my voice. I am not afraid of men anymore. I, like I said, I perceive it as weakness and their inability to just grow up. <laughs> Again, I may have a very jaded biased opinion, but so I'm always looking at that and trying to do that work while I'm still healing. Um, one thing that I was disappointed on was I wanted more of the deep dive of the mythology, which is interesting for me because I've never been a fan of history, but I think I'm a fan of storytelling. So that's one thing that I'm really looking forward to in reading about this one. Um, this one is a translated, it's a novel and four essays. Um, written, I believe, by Krista Wolf and is translated by Jan Van Hurek. Um, this is so interesting. So it's Cassandra. And then when you flip open the thing, it has somebody's name and the 1989, which was the year I was born. So of course I'm going to read into that as a sign. Um, so this book has been around for 33 years at least since someone gave it as a gift to someone. I'm excited to get into this. Like I said, I'm only a couple pages in, so I've got a lot of reading to do in the next four days to get this done. Then I will film my review of this and then get this video up for you guys. But yeah, I just really wanted a deep dive. I'm not gonna wrap this up too quickly because I still have to read this one and review it, but that was Cassandra Speaks. When women are storytellers, the human story changes. Very interesting topic piece. Gets a lot of gears in my head turning and makes me feel more confident kind of deep diving into these types of conversations with people, I think, which is like the bump I wanted from it. Um, and honestly, it just makes me appreciate my name more. For a long time, I always wanted to go by Cassie because I hated Cassandra my whole life growing up. I wanted my name to be Samantha when I was a little girl and not Cassandra, I hated my name. But now I appreciate it, I'm having appreciation for it, and I will be back when I review this one, so. Yeah, see you when that one's done. <sighs> it's the evening time, two days before Halloween, and I powered through this and struggled through this, but I want to give, I can't give a review. <laughs> I wasn't into this, it wasn't awful. It kind of, I kind of got lost and maybe it's my lack of knowledge of over tons of Greek, Greek mythology. Um, but it just felt like a train of thought. And in the beginning of the book, it is um, Crystal Wolf's, which is translated from German. But it gave her novel portion. And then the last four essays is like a mixture of like journal entry kind of related research basically which i appreciated the research that she put into gathering everything to write this novel it just i don't know so i think the best way that i can think to do this because i really sat there and struggled about what to say about my review so i'm going to read three I'm going to read parts from three other reviews um, on Goodread. My kid's extremely loud right now. <laughs> but this just helps me... <sighs> this just helps me like put this into words better because I feel like I really struggled a way to like review this. I didn't really bookmark anything or dog ear anything or underline anything. I just was like spinning in circles kind of reading a lot of this. She said... This first review is by someone named Candy who claims their name was originally Cassandra, so on and so forth. Um, she says, in any case, I've always been a bit intrigued by this enigmatic woman and have always wanted to learn a bit more about her than the opportunity to read this book came along. Am I still a fan of Cassandra? Of course, did I love the book? To peace is not even close. It had so much potential like this, for example, quote, the dreadful torment took the form of voice, forced its way out of me, through me, dismembering me as it went, and set itself free. A whistling little voice, whistling at the end of its rope, to make that makes my blood run cold and my hair stand on end, which is which as it swells, grows louder and more hideous, sets all the members of ringling and rattling and hurling about, 
but the voice does not care. It floats above me free and shrieks, 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 end quote. But the moment of brilliant prose brilliant the moments of brilliant prose were far and few between for this greedy reader <laughs> my edition included the main story cassandra as well as four essays these essays revolved around author krista wolf's travel to greece as well as her research for the novel where wolf really shines is her research capabilities i agree um it was evident from her essays as well as the novel itself that she did an extensive amount of work before setting her pen to paper the problem is that it's just not a very compelling story. I don't know, perhaps I'm spoiled. She like goes on to talk about Cersei. Um, <laughs> she says, what I did appreciate is that Cassandra has a unique voice here. She is still a woman we've heard, and that was given the gift of prophecy, but cursed that no one ever believing her visions, but she's a whole lot more than that. She's a very, very early feminist idol as Wolf shapes her for us. She's not a woman to be pitied or scorned. She has strengths of character and perhaps her gift was not really just a random occurrence, but rather comes from her being a woman with great wisdom and the ability to understand people. Yes, I'm being selfishly accepting that as my life. <laughs> um, her foresight was not simply a gift bestowed on her, but some god, but by some god, but an instinct and genius that came from within. As Wolf explains to us, quote, the vision, the vision which overwhelms her no longer have anything to do with the ritual decrees of her oracle. She sees the future because she has the courage to see things that are already in the present. She does not achieve this alone. Cassandra makes contact with minorities among the socially and ethnically heterogeneous groups in and around the palace. By doing so, she consciously moves off the beaten track, strips herself of all privileges, exposes herself to suspicion, scorn, persecution, the price of her independence, no self-pity, she lives her life even in war." End quote. This, is, this person wrote, this is the message I'd like to take away from Cassandra. I live with the being to the namesake of such a woman. So despite my singing the praises to the series, I cannot tell a lie. This main story in particular was hard work, dry and academic for the most part. What I did enjoy was the author's story, a stream of consciousness, that's a great way to describe it, written about her preparations for the book. I wouldn't mind reading more of her nonfiction work, but I'm going to be a bit reluctant in the future when it comes to her fiction. And then the quote from the book, which I liked this one too, says, quote, believe me, not believe me, they would see after all in the long run, it was impossible for people not to believe a person who proves she is right. I'm sorry if it feels like I'm rushing through this. I am also cooking a ton of dinner downstairs, but I wanted to get this out before I moved on. Um, the last one, not the last one, the second one, was talking about kind of what the novel was about, which if you didn't know, this work, this work deals with the well-known story of the Trojan War, but through the first-person viewpoint of Cassandra, the most famous of the Trojan royal family's many daughters, who was doomed to prophesy the fall of the city, but never to be believed. Someone, they also said, the novel itself is a stream of consciousness style flashback as Cassandra waits outside the palace, knowing she is about to be murdered, and that Agamemnon, her captor, is already being murdered inside. Inasmuch as most of the men seem to be waging war against women more than against each other, the work can be considered feminist, although Cassandra herself never succeeds in challenging the status quo effectively and is silenced more and more as the war drags on. Ultimately, it is a rather downbeat tale, but this is a Greek tragedy. The slang which Woof brings to it is to make it Cassandra's tragedy rather than tragedy rather than the ancient Greek view in which she was a mere adject to Agamemnon's fate. Given the very uneven nature of the work for me, this person only rates it two stars, which I didn't even discuss. I think I'm giving it two and a half. So I'm on the fence of like rating it. I'm a good reads person, either a two or a three. I'm not sure. I'll probably put a two and put two and a half. Um, and then the last one I wanted to read to you, which felt really good too, was, while I admit the book is an interesting book and a study on the reimagining of a character, as a piece of fiction it fails in many ways. The story has no overarching structure, more a series of random thoughts and anecdotes loosely linked together by a time period. The essays attempt to give a reader an insight into the author's working progress or process, but these fail too. 
for much the same reason. They don't necessarily show the reader how the author developed her novella and also have no definite, definitive structure in the writing. On top of all this, the book reads as slow as molasses. Agree. Dripping from the bottom of the bottle and it's hard to recall what you just read a few pages ago and does not, 100% with Rufus, does not lend itself to the put down, pick back up again reading method. I cannot agree with that last sentiment more because there is literally no chapter break. It doesn't exist. There is no like chapter one this, chapter two that, nothing. It is just, and it's dumb because it's not a run-on sentence. Clearly they're form sentences, big language, a lot of Greek mythology stuff in here that I was having a hard time keeping track of, but it like, from the beginning, it just feels like a run-on sentence. There's no break, there's no break. So out of these two that I read this month, this was the more disappointing one, where I thought this would give me more, it definitely gives the mythological side of gr Greek Cassandra and everything, um, but I just found myself rather confused and like I totally agree with the stream of consciousness and there feels like there is no point that you can stop to catch a breath and then you forget like when I sat down to after taking a break and then read again I feel like I forgot so much. So these two I'm hoping 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 I can get through the shining light um, and have that as a very quick review for the last bit of October. Um, I have another day to maybe film and get that done, and I have half the book, so we'll see. But <sighs> otherwise, this was definitely the shining star, and I'm so happy that I read this. I um, highly recommend this. Just, oh, like I said, I think it's really relevant to someone who needs the confirmation or wants more stories about things within feminism, but also just being believed and the story of women in general and how much of a bad taste it has left in most men specifically's mouth growing up and through history, not growing up, but through history. Um, I think this is great for that. Like I said, the last third of this is like exercises for someone um, that I think is an invaluable resource to someone that is going through some stuff and maybe this be their first like journey into trying to heal and get better and smash that patriarchy, am I right? <laughs> That's so dramatic, but help someone feel more confident in themselves, uh, maybe some self-love, definitely love that for this. This was disappointing, this will not be staying. This will be. I would love to do a reread of this maybe at some point, um, especially since I dog-eared so much. And the only reason I have this in here is not my bookmark. I have that in there because it's where she talks about, and I didn't mention this before, um, but she mentions TED Talks, which her one from five years ago, I'll link below, I think is a good one. Her one from 11 years ago does not fly in society now, and I don't think it was a good one at all. So be careful with that. <laughs> Um, and then she mentions another podcast in here, which I did not watch before reviewing this. Not a podcast, a TED Talk. Um, so I still want to do that. So that's why this little bookmark is in there is for the TED Talk. That was me for my birthday, for my birthday month, for October. <laughs> it is not all about me, but darn it, will I find a way to make it about myself if I can. Um, yeah, we'll see if this shining light comes in. I almost feel like I need to because I don't want to do an outro now. So I'll see you for this shining light. And then if I mess up and I don't do it in the next day, then bye and see you in the next one. <laughs> I'll be back. Promise. I'm gonna finish it. Okay, different day. I think I was wearing a skeleton <laughs> sweater in the last one too. I only own two. It just happened to catch me on those days. I'm coming in here quickly to end this October what I read. Um, I guess like when I read wrap up <laughs> and I pushed through and finished this shining life, um, a, a novel by Harriet Klein. Uh, 
I just like, <laughs> first I want to say when I sped through and gave not the best, probably lighthearted or happy review about this, I was and have been dealing with some really bad migraines. We had our first snow here in Colorado and I think the cold really affects things, um, especially like with the metal and stuff that I have in and around my eye. So I've been struggling with that and I actually had to miss a couple days of work because I just could not get them under control. But I seem to be doing a bit better now, hopefully. Um, I haven't had anything in the last two days, so that's been great. So I was able to finish this Shining Life. Um, tomorrow is actually Halloween, um, which is crazy that it's already going to be November. But to wrap this up, let me read the back for you and kind of just go from there. I don't have a great review about it. I don't even know if I said what I rated the other two that I read this month. Read, rated this five out of five. Still feel pretty solid, maybe like four and a half out of five. I struggle with five out of five rating, ratings. And then I gave this a two and a half, two star. Two star feels rude. Three, I don't want to say three star though. Two and a half, a solid two and a half um, out of five. And then this one, I'm probably going to rate this as a three star. For some reason, when I bought this brand new, it's the cover that really spoke to me. Um, flora and Fauna is like top tier visuals, not only the color, I just appreciate the subjects of it. So that's kind of what got me to pick this up. But to read over the synopsis, it says, meet Ollie, he's 11 years old. He hasn't yet met a killer Sudoku he can't solve, but he finds the world around him difficult. People don't say what they mean and he hates being wrong. And now sudden, now a sudden tragedy teaches him there is no easier, no easy answer to, oh my gosh, to the problem of grief, my battery is blinking. When Ollie's happy-go-lucky father, Rich, dies of cancer, his mother, Ruth, has no idea how to keep living. The entire family is thrown into, sur into disarray. The only thing that makes sense to Ollie is the puzzle he's convinced his father left behind. One gift for each member of the family. If Ollie can find the connection between a pink face and an old pair of binoculars, then somehow he'll discover the secret he believes Rich wanted to share with them all, what it means to be alive. Interweaving the characters' voices, the deeply felt novel paints a portrait of a family learning to come together through the darkest times. This shining life is a poignant yet ultimately uplifting meditation on grief, healing, and love. I absolutely agree with that. Honestly, <laughs> it's like kind of my review is the synopsis itself. That's exactly what the book's about. Um, each chapter is through someone else's perspective. So in a way, you kind of feel like since you're not involved and you're just reading through their perspectives, you almost feel like a family friend um, who's hearing everybody's deepest feelings going through this tragedy, which was a nice way to spin it, I think. And in the beginning, uh, it starts with, you know, prognosis day and then how many weeks before, what was this one? This one's like six weeks after prognosis. And then I think the scene where the father passes is really tragic. Um, obviously someone dying is tragic, but I just mean like trying to envision it through an 11 year old's eyes, which I do have an 11 year old. So I don't know, I tried to like envision things through his perspective of his like mindset as an 11 year old. Um, but you could see the naivety in the child of thinking that there was this puzzle to solve, which Sudoku fits his character, um, of that there is some quick solution answer to figuring out how to successfully live. But through the book, you see kind of the family is a hot mess and no one is paying mind to each other. Um, and death typically tends to either force people together or force them apart if they were close. and. I think it's kind of about the journey of people that were torn apart before grief, the grief, they learn each other, they learn how to adapt and work with each other um, as they go through healing and grief. Um, and so grief, you know, you know me guys, if you've ever been here or seen one of these, like grief is a topic that I deep dive into fairly often because I'm always trying to heal through mine. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, three star just because I found a lot of it not boring, but I just like wasn't tracking what the heck was happening quite kind of in quite a bit of it. It just what like it just wasn't my note, I guess. Um, it didn't like do amazing things for me. It wasn't awful. So I think solid three star, but those were my books for October. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to leave this. I will see you guys in November. I have quite a few on my TBR for the month. So I did up my book count goal for the year from 52 to 60 and I'm at 56 I think 57 with finishing this so I should hit that no problem probably even in November and surpass it hopefully into December which is epic it's the most I've ever read in my life in a year um but yeah thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys in November and look forward to reading or watching everybody else's book reviews for the month and what they read and what's coming up in November and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye! <laughs>